thank you for being here, nice and early. Um, and I guess we're kind of like the unofficial openers for DreamHack, which is exciting. So, yeah, thank you for coming on. Before we start, I want to take a moment to acknowledge the uh, traditional owners of the land, the, land, uh, the one jury people of the Kulin Nation. Uh, we gather today on their ancestral lands and we pay respects to elders past, present, and emerging. Uh, their continuous connection to this land is a significant part of Melbourne's story. So, to quickly introduce myself, uh, I'm Richard, the founder and director of Ace Creators Management. And I'm Maddie, Creative Partnerships Manager at Ace Creators. So it's great to see so many familiar faces here today. We're so excited to be spending the weekend here with you guys in Melbourne, even though it is freezing cold. Um, <laughs> from Sydney. Um, so as you've seen from the title of this panel, uh, we're going to explore what it means to build your brand as a creator in Australia today. Um, and we're going to hear from this awesome group of panelists about their careers and their experiences. So, let's, uh, yeah, let's introduce who we have on the stage today. Uh, a group of creative content across basically every platform in some way or another uh, with some great insights into what it takes to establish your brand as a content creator. So, uh, from the end, we have Walkerman. Uh, we have JJ Bin. We have Nino. And we have Alyssa. How are you feeling, guys? Have we got your mics working? I think. Seems ready like it's to, working. Ready to roll. Yeah, there we yes. go. Jojo has an invisible mic. I'm good. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, we might crack into the, the first question, um, which I'll give over to Maddie to, uh, to get things started. Cool, guys. So, can you tell us when did your passion for content creation begin? How did that evolve into a career over time, leading to where you are today? So we'll start with Alyssa. Yeah, I think for myself, I've always been very creative driven. Um, I come from a photography background, and so a lot of the skills that I learned there when I started content creating kind of transitioned over. Originally when I started, I did it during lockdown, like I'm sure a lot of people did, and did it as a passion to just have a creative outlet whilst I was in lockdown. And as I started growing, I felt like every opportunity that came my way, I was like, oh wow, this is really something that I could maybe flip into what could be a career, uh, which is where it's landed me today. So I think taking every opportunity that I've gotten has allowed that transition to be very fluid. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah I think much the same. I've always had a passion for it. Um, I think it stems from just being a kid, always playing games. I used to watch a lot of content too, um, and I think I knew it was always something that I wanted to do. And my background in college was media uh, production, stuff like that, so I was always interested in it. And what's just started as a hobby, you know, coming home from after class, playing video games, I thought, well, I'll just post it with no intention of doing it as a career, just as a hobby. You know, I didn't even tell my friends about it, I mean, no one's known about my channel there. And uh, eventually, it, yeah, it took off and I realised, okay, this could actually be something that I want to pursue. Yeah, um, same here, like, I was like, as a kid, I was a drama nerd and really just loved attention. Um, so <laughs> I was, yeah, a little bit of a weird unit, uh, but it was, um, yeah, I guess I've always watched a lot of creators, like I guess on YouTube as well, and, and then I was always like, always looked up to them, and then I guess during COVID, I, we, as we all did, we went into like that TikTok hole, and then I came across Sims Talk, so I was Sims 4 builder, so that's my niche, and basically I was like, oh, this is cool, and I got into The Sims, even though I was like, into The Sims when I was a kid, and then I was like, oh, I love this game, and then I just kept on building, and I was like, oh, there's some tips that I want to kind of make some videos, so other people making videos, I'm like, I can do it too, and then I just started doing it, and then it's gotten me to where I am now, I just kept on going and evolving, and it's been a lot of fun, and I love the attention. <laughs> Um, I'm like the others, I was never really creative at all. Um, I played games pretty much all day every day for the most part um, when I wasn't doing like sport or something. So um, branching into that, I was very much a shy person, but then I saw a few friends start to do it and I'm like, mm, yeah, right, I'll give it a try. 
and then one day I just bought everything on Amazon and kind of forced myself to do it. So I didn't waste like 200 bucks. So, um, <laughs> good lights for that. Um, but yeah, finding so many cool people and friends and community and everything, which very, very quickly evolved, uh, it became a bit of an addiction actually. So, um, to the point where I, if I wasn't live, I was thinking about being live, thinking about what other people were doing, um, hanging out in people's chats, just um, it became a bit of an obsession really. So, uh, it's kind of just evolved from there. It was like COVID lockdown. And created it was also lockdown. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Very bored. I love how everyone else said uh, it's all about their creativity, and Matt was just like, "I'm not creative at all." So it's good to know you can still you can still be a creator, not be creative. Um, I guess adding yeah to that question, um, how did you decide what kinds of content you were going to make, um, and which platforms like did you land on initially, and how did that kind of go about uh, with the type of content you were making? Yeah, I guess for myself, like I'm very much into kind of cozy games like Animal Crossing and Stardew Valley and they were a lot of the games that I was already playing during lockdown initially. So I, that's essentially what I thought I would start with because I was like, well, I'm already playing it in lockdown. So it's easier just to set everything up and then just keep playing. But then I'm also doing the streaming aspect. Um, originally, I did start on Twitch because that was my discovery to live streaming and just the online world around that. But as I grew and evolved with that, I then slowly started to transition to other things as well, like different content offline and TikTok as well. And TikTok has been such an awesome and lovely community that I've formed while still being able to do the same thing I love across each platform. So yeah, I think as I've grown and transitioned into like crazy stuff and things that I just like and love, um, it's been really nice being able to form communities on both platforms that still love the same thing I do. So you kind of like go with the flow a bit in terms of where the community is leading you. Yeah, pretty much. Because like I've always been very for the community, and like the community is what drives me to stream. Like I love the people I meet. I love the people that I get to talk to and hang out with. And like a lot of that then just transitioned across, and I just get to do what I love. Yeah, which is really cool. Uh, Mimi, yes. as, as our YouTube expert, tell us. Uh, about that. Oh, expert. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we'll go with that. Um, yeah, I think mine started as. Uh, crippling addiction to the video game Rust, probably, uh, before lockdown. And uh, just always, always been into gaming, and I knew if I was going to do it, my niche would definitely be gaming, because I'm doing that anyway, so I might as well record it. Um, but yeah, I think I really got into the whole survival game aspect. Um, I love all those games like Minecraft, everything, and I really enjoyed watching that content, and I think I, this is maybe just for me, but whatever content I enjoyed watching, I would go, well, that's what I want to sort of make, you know? Um, but yeah, that's, that's where it stemmed from for me, anyway. And uh, yeah, how does it compare, like, on YouTube compared to other platforms? Because you've streamed before as well. In terms yeah. of, like, the way you go about your, your week and like, any work you do, how does that how's I think that me in particular, it's, I've tried other platforms, but YouTube's always kind of been, like, my bread and butter. Um, so I always just find myself coming back to it, you know, if I try and branch out to like streaming stuff I spend less time on YouTube and so I just feel like for me personally I prefer just committing to the one platform which has always been YouTube for me because that's what's worked the best and that's probably the one that I enjoy the most uh, because again I've got a media background, I love editing, I love all that stuff, the behind the scenes of it, so yeah, but that's for, that's for me personally. Out of interest, uh, all of you have edited videos and you, you, do you still edit videos or is it a bit of a mix? I'm a one woman show. Yes. <laughs> I do everything. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, ain't nobody got money for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a very common theme. I feel like editing is such like a, a great skill to kind of get yourself into the content creation space. It's such a fun skill to learn as well. Like even when I think about a lot of the brand work I did last year with every video, I just took it as an opportunity to learn something new. Um, and it really helps. Uh, JJ, what about you in terms of uh, yeah, streaming and, and I guess how you kind of ended up in that, that sort of content? Yeah, well, I basically, um, I did start at TikTok, so like, because I did, I am lazy and I can't edit long form videos, <laughs> I also don't have the attention span for it as well, so I was like, sweet, short form, this is great, this is quick wins, and that's what I loved about TikTok, was like, you could just reach so many people so quickly, and like, just with not as much effort as you would for YouTube, so I really like, you know, down the head that you're put at YouTube because that's like really hard to do. 
for me especially. But um, yeah, TikTok, and I'm I'm like just spinning through photos, I mean videos really quickly too. So for me, it keeps my attention. So I made what I like to watch myself, and then um, I guess. I then, I then did dabble and into streaming. I was like, oh, I kind of was interested in streaming, and then I went into Twitch for like two, two years, and then I fell pregnant, and then I just stopped doing Twitch. I, like, I just grinded so hard at Twitch. It was just like, so hard to grow on Twitch. Like, I was kicking off on, on TikTok. It was like in the tens of thousands of followers pretty like early on. And then I was like, why isn't this like kind of converting? And then I was just kind of getting frustrated, but then all of a sudden, you know, TikTok Live came down. I was doing TikTok Lives about a year and a half ago, I think, and like they popped off. I was like 700 people watching me. I was like, what the hell? Like I'm used to only like 20 or 30, which is still great for Twitch, obviously. But um, I just really loved that dopamine hit and that reward, and I was like, oh, I like this. And so I wanted to keep going with it. But then again, pregnancy stopped me, and then I just came back. I guess consistency since December last year. And then um, my niche as well, building this on The Sims. Um, so The Sims was my niche, but I didn't enjoy the gameplay of it, which is funny because I don't actually like playing the actual game. <laughs> I, just, I could relate to that. Yeah, with yeah, I, relate <laughs> to yeah, I get it. I'm like, how many times can you rehearse someone? You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's it's basically a career in construction is what you're doing, right? As a as a yeah. Sims Sims builder. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I mean, it's a niche within a niche, and then. Yeah, and then I just kind of um, kept on building just like big, kind of crazy builds and that got a lot of attention. And I went viral when I built the casita from Encanto. I always say that wrong, people get so mad at me. Encanto, casita, sorry. And then, um, and then that just kicked off and then I was like, yeah, it's like an addiction, isn't it? Like, you just kind of want to keep going because you get that buzz. You're like, oh, people like this, I'm going to keep making things. And yeah, and it's just, and then learning how to edit my own videos as well, like just doing it all myself. It's just that extra reward by learning that stuff yourself um, is great. And you know, and like adding your comedic timing to it or like where you cut, it's like it's just a lot of fun. It's just the whole process of it, I really enjoy it. So, yeah, awesome. um, I started on, I was mostly just on Twitch for like a good two years, I'd say. Um, just playing nothing but horror. Indie horror, the worst type of Shank nonsense you could possibly find that barely ran. Um, I would break 90% of the games I would play, um, and we had fun with it. You know, we had fun with it, but um, I guess the problem was with that, I was genuinely terrified of every single game I played. So, um, what happened with me was I ended up branching over to TikTok eventually and started making some posts and getting editing and stuff as well. Um, and I was like, let's try the cosier side of things, because I started scarring the tissue in my throat from screaming so loud. Um, which is not good. Don't, I don't recommend it's, that. It's funny you said that, because I remember the first time we met, I, uh, yeah, I saw you were obviously doing a lot of horror content, and I was like, man, you must have nerves of steel to play these kinds of games. And you just said, no, like, I'm terrified the entire time. Yeah. Just punishing yourself. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it wasn't good. Um, but branching over to like the TikTok side of things, that blew up very quickly, very, very fast, and pretty much hasn't stopped. And that was from, uh, I want to say like 10 months ago now, um, to the point where now I'm a full-time content creator, where I was not even close to that prior. Um, so yeah, that's, and like I still dabble on Twitch, and we're still doing like lots of YouTube content with like group YouTube stuff and some other plans in the in the future as well, but um, as JJ mentioned as well, it's it's very addictive to see those numbers, see all those people come in, the community build really fast, and um, yeah, the community just and that's people you wouldn't usually find in like a gaming space either. You know, it might be um, a mum of three who's up at three and because her kids crying and she's just scrolling TikTok and she's like, oh yeah, this is cool. And then people like that you wouldn't expect to be in a gaming space would come and you know say hi and hang out, and then they. They're still here six, seven months later, so. Um, but yeah, that's kind of like my journey at the moment, and it's been really fun. It's really cool. So something that we talk about often is the importance of developing your personal brand as a content creator. Can you guys explain your individual processes into developing that personal brand, and how you've maintained that brand across the different content that you make? 
I would say for myself that I love to bring a lot of my personality into my brand. Uh, so when I first started out as a content creator, I kind of really went in on things that I loved, like the colour purple, or like Panda Melon was my original username before I switched over to my actual name. So things like that, where there were easy things to talk about, but then I could then build it into a brand. As that started to evolve, I, and I guess I started learning a lot of the skills behind that, I started bringing a lot of my personality into what I do. So when I learned how to edit videos, if someone was to look at a video, they'd be like, oh, that's an Alyssa video because she's edited in a certain way. Or like if I've taken a photo or something, they'd be like, that's an Alyssa photo because she's composed it in a certain way. So I found that the personality side for me is what really allowed me to build my brand um, and kind of make me stand out a bit more versus, um, I guess, only classifying myself as a content creator. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, likewise, trying to get my personality into it uh, was definitely a big thing for me. Um, not originally starting out though, I remember when I started out, I just was like, I'm not even going to talk, I'm just going to play the game, I don't want anyone to know who I am. <laughs> so I don't know why I was posting videos, it, but um, I think for me personally, it, it goes through a lot of different uh, changes and sort of almost like seasons. Like there's been a lot of season changes throughout my whole YouTube journey. Uh, like the first content I was making was like skits and like cinematics for, for Rust and then it moved into more of just gameplay with commentary and then it moved into, you know, trying too hard to be funny, which didn't really work. And then, it, you know, transitioned back into gameplay but with more solid ideas and more structure, um, which is definitely what I want to continue doing now. And I think, um, yeah, through all different mediums, when someone sees your thumbnail, they go, oh, that's a Mimeo video. Um, if someone hears my voice, they go, oh, geez, that's a Mimeo video. <laughs> so that one up. Yeah, but I, it's just, like you said, getting your personality in there and sort of intertwining it with the content you want to make. And that's hopefully why people keep coming back for you. Yeah, same thing, basically. It's just like my personality just became my brand, I guess. Like, just being... Um, a lot of people come in saying I'm a bit cringe, I'm a cringy millennial, and I'm like, you know what, I'm proud of that. <laughs> um, just kind of piggyback off that, just be weird, don't be afraid to be weird, things like that, and that's why I'm, like, I'm, I'm proud of it, like, and I do a lot of silly things on on stream, and I just sometimes think back, and I'm like, what? That was, there was like 600 people watching me twerk, or something like that. Um, and, uh, yeah, but you just kind of, you, you just ignore it, just keep going, but like that's, that's was just my thing, my personality kind of was what, I guess, was my, was my brand, so, yeah. Did you find that your brand changed across platforms, like when you moved from Twitch to TikTok, did that? Yeah, actually, brand? yeah, like on Twitch, I was very foul now, like, swore a lot, and what was like JD stop swearing, and I was like, oh, man, that's who I am. But it's not your identity, people. You can stop swearing. Um, <laughs> so I have a I have a son now, so I'm like I've got to learn not to swear. So it was actually good practice for me. So I'm a little bit more family friendly now. <laughs> Proud of yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, thank you. But um, yeah, no. So my friend has definitely changed there. Like, and I feel like ever since I started just to take it a bit more seriously and become a bit more professional about it, um, it's opened a lot more doors. And I think it's just important if you really want to take it seriously, yeah, yeah don't self sabotage in that way, like, you, you know? But, like, um, yeah, I think the most of yeah. <laughs> um, I have to double down on the personality as well. Um, you know, I was, I was mentioned before how I play lots of different random nonsense games, and if we're playing for the game that no one knows existed, then it's probably not going to go very far at all either. So, um, yeah, it, it's kind of nice to be known as that person who is probably going to cause chaos in something that's supposed to be really easy, um, at least for the live streaming purpose. You know, you might be playing an animal shelter game and have seven sick cats and one dog in the street when it's supposed <laughs> to be very simple. <laughs> um, but also from like a professionalism side of things, I think it's, for me, it's important to have at least like video structures, like similar types of captions, maybe similar types of music using your videos, something to really identify, like, yep, this is a Walkman video, um, as mentioned previously as well. Um, and just kind of um, making everything lighthearted as possible, as normal as possible, not so structured and scripted, I think, as well, to me, is very important. So, yeah, keep the standing. And Matt, in the past year, you've had very much been pioneering the impact of being on TV. 
TikTok Live, which previously hadn't really been done before. Can you tell us a little bit about like how that started and how it's changed your content creation over time? Yeah, definitely. I I actually did TikTok Lives couple, like when it first came out a couple of years ago. Um, a couple of us started and it didn't really go anywhere because it was very new, very, very new. And we were like, oh yeah. And then gave it a try again as like a branch out to, you know, move away from horror. And it, it exploded like crazy. We had, um, again, not many people on there. Every stream was like 1,000 to 3,000 viewers um, to the point where I was like, how do I speak to this chat? I, I, don't, I don't know what to uh, really do because <laughs> I'm not, you know, used to maybe like 150 to 200, not 3,000. Um, but again, it was one of those things where I did a lot of trial and error during that period and I kind of worked out what did best for me and ex yeah, experimented a lot. So I kind of made a little database in my head, I suppose, as to what might be best and it's done pretty well so far. So I think a lot of people have, you know, starting the Ace Creators Live program, um, have kind of taken on advice that we've given based off that experimenting um, and are now doing pretty well as well. So. Um, it's been a fun journey and you know, would never look back. Yeah, I think going, going back to the uh, personal brand question um, quickly, I think it's, it's, it is super interesting. Obviously, you all talk about your personalities being the most important thing. Um, you know, I think when you think about content creation, so many people can play the same games and, you know, the format can look very similar, but I think the one thing that's so unique and that you can bring into it is, is your own personality. So I think as Jay just said, embracing that, that weirdness of like yourself is so important. Um, and I think it's, yeah, it's what's really kind of set you guys apart um, and does so well. So I think it's really important to take away is really embracing and like the personality you bring, you bring to the table as well. Um, so let's briefly talk about working with, with sponsors. I think it's, you know, it's such a, a commonplace thing in, in, um, in content creators. Um, and obviously the, the, the experience can vary so drastically. Um, so, without naming specific brand names, I think that's, that's probably a good thing to say. Uh, would anyone like to share yeah, a really great experience um, they've had in the collaboration and maybe one that wasn't so great um, that they've learned from as well? Every, almost every brand that I've worked with has been so kind and so lovely. And I think for me, I'm always just appreciative that brands want to work with me. And so, like, I remember last year, one goal of mine was just to build a portfolio of stuff with brands that I've worked with. And the fact that people wanted to reach out to me was such a blessing in itself. So it's hard to really pinpoint any kind of bad ones, but um, for the most part, all of the companies I've worked with have been amazing. The only one I can think of where it was a little bit difficult was there was one company that reached out to me with a briefing for a product. And they said, we want a two hour stream and we want some still images. And that's all we want, nothing more, nothing less. Uh, and in the initial meeting I had with them, I, because sometimes I like to spit all ideas, I threw out the idea of doing a video content, like maybe a short reel, like a TikTok or an Instagram reel, because they always get good engagement. And straight away they were like, no, we don't want that. We only want the stills and we want the two hour. And I said, that's okay. You know, it never hurts to ask or shoot your shot and, you know, just figure out how you want to work with these brands and what they want as well. The following week, I started getting all these follows from these people where I'm like, some of these names look really familiar. Um, and they were the people that I had the initial briefing with. And I, within half an hour afterwards, they're like, oh, you know what? I think we do want some video content and maybe a reel. I was like, okay, yeah, like you've given me 48 hours notice to do this. I don't know if that's gonna be enough time. And I, I also work a day job as well. So trying to fit content and stuff in between that, um, even though maybe 48 hours to them, to me it's probably like half of that. So I tried to very diplomatically explain that I had such little time, but they were so persistent on it. I was like, okay, we're gonna somehow make this work. I managed to shoot and edit and draft a video within 12 hours. And oddly enough, it's probably one of the best rules that I've done. So I feel like, oh, <laughs> I feel like the takeaway that I took from that is, aside from working well under pressure, don't be afraid to take any opportunity, no matter what time frame, because you never know like what limit you can push yourself to to deliver your best work. So basically, they ended up going with the the recognition you give them 
yep. from the start. Yeah. Just a lot later. Yeah, 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 just yeah. like a week later. Yes. Like that, that extra week would have been really helpful, but <laughs> that's okay. You know, you make the most of what you get, right? Yeah. So although it was a difficult situation, the end result was still well worth it because it just adds to my portfolio of cool things I've done. Yeah, oh, yeah. that's great. Very good. James, what are you? Yeah, I think most of the brands I've worked with have been pretty positive. Um, and I'm not too sure how specific I could get with each one, but I, what I really not, like... Not very. No, 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 no. Well, let's just start naming brands. Uh, 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 but what I really like when a brand does approach a sponsorship is having a good, clear brief. I think that's really important. I think we can all relate to that. There is nothing worse than when a brand comes to you and they have the messiest brief. There's no video resources. There's like a hundred different points they want fit in a 60 second slot. It's like, it's impossible. And then you've got to go through, you know, 20 revisions of that sponsor just to get it approved. Um, so yeah, there's been a lot of positives, a lot of negatives. Um, if I think of one in particular, there was definitely a, uh, I want to say, a food health brand uh, <laughs> that sent, they wanted to send a product out first before they sponsored me. And so uh, they sent it out and they wanted me to try and see what I think and it tasted Horror. It was like, it tasted like pure onion. I don't know what it was. And we never got back to it. So, yeah, uh, that was definitely a horror story. But, um, yeah, honestly, just keep the briefs clean and simple, please. That's, yeah, that's all we did. Yeah, that is a good one, yeah. Um, literally same thing with me. My horror story, I'm just going to dive right in, a food subscription company. Um, I was, I was, Pregnant, morning sickness, <laughs> and that means when I ate anything, I would feel sick. And they're like, "You've got to try it on stream." <laughs> and I kept on myself saying, "I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I've got morning sickness, I can't do it, I can't do it." And then one time I did it, it's like I, my face doesn't lie. That's the issue. So I was just like, "It's good, <laughs> it's great." <laughs> 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 Yeah, right, so you, you'd like communicated that with them and they were just like, no, we really yeah, want you to Yeah, they're like, this will wait till you're all good. So they waited like a solid two months until I was like steady better to eat it on stream. Well, but yeah. I was still like pretty rubbish. It was, yeah. yeah, so yeah, I was like, this is fine. Um, but yeah, that was, yeah, they didn't work with me after that. <laughs> um, but in terms of like good experiences, like, yeah, I've had a few good ones as well. And a lot of brands that kind of work with me, um, like every now and again, which is really nice, and yeah, like you know, same thing. Like clear briefs is really important and stuff like that. But yeah, that was my main highlight, which was that food one. So yeah. Um, yeah, clear briefs, clear briefs. I've had a couple that didn't necessarily have a clear brief, but they're like, we want this, 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 and this must be in it. Here's some assets. Please use it. Um, but then you're free to make whatever you want, and they meant it. And if they mean that, and you can actually just go with it, then that is fantastic. Um, if they're like, mention this, and then they give you nothing else, and then as soon as you get 20 revisions, being like, actually, we wanted this. Actually, we've translated the script into another language and translated it back, <laughs> and now we want you to say this, but it doesn't make sense, but this is what we want you to say. Um, stuff like that, it's like, Okay, this, this is not great. Um, so yeah, clear briefs, make sure it's, um, the whole thing's kind of laid out, unless they're fine with accepting what you're doing, um, if there's no brief mention. Yeah, I think a great, a great takeaway here for, for content creators is, I think just, yeah, be confident um, in, in talking to the brands. Um, and if the brief, if you're not happy with it, I think be vocal about it because uh, if you're not, it's going to make your life a lot harder um, and the end product isn't going to be as good as well. So I think, um, yeah, having that confidence just to say, like, you know, make either make suggestions or request a sort of revision, I think that's such an important thing to do and you'll definitely thank yourself later for doing it. Um, and, yeah, I think it's just something not to be afraid of because it is really important and the brand's going to get a better experience as well. The end product is going to be better for, for everyone, for sure. Especially if it's something you're not comfortable with as well. In them as well. Yeah, I think a big green flag for brands is when they give you a bit of wiggle room for your own creative direction, adding your personality, because at the end of the day you guys know your audience is best, um, so that always ends up making the best content. 
Um, okay, so before we open up to any audience questions, um, I want to ask each of you, looking back on your creative journey and your careers, what's one piece of advice you'd give your past self or to some of the aspiring creators here in the crowd today? For me, I would tell my past self to believe in myself more because I know confidence was a really big thing when I started. And I used to be so self-aware of every stream I did, every little thing that would go wrong, everything I would put out that wasn't on a live streaming platform. And over time, I've learned to get better at that. But if you just have fun with it, the confidence will shine through. So that's what I would say to my past self. 100%, that's a real good one, damn. Um, I'm gonna cheat and say two. Uh, I would say the first one, and this is what I've told anyone that's ever asked me for advice or anything, I would say, just try everything. Like whatever niche you wanna pick, let's say it's gaming, you know, try, try every possible thing that you wanna do in that niche, and just try them all, just give it a crack, because eventually what you see is one or two of those videos will do better than the others, or you know, that stream will do better than the others. And then I would say, keep pursuing that idea. I mean, do different variations of that until you really figure out not only what the people want to see, but what you really enjoy making. Um, and the second thing I would say is just post it. Like, there's nothing worse, and I'm, you know, a perfectionist, nothing worse than sitting there for d days, weeks, months, going, oh, I can't do this video, I need the microphone, I need this PC part, I can't do it. Just post it, just do it. This, uh, there, there is a saying coming here, I'll think of it. It is, um, that was it. Completion over perfection. Exactly, my words there. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> you want to quote that, put it on a t-shirt, that was yeah. from me. Uh, but yeah, it's, perfection is the enemy of progress. Even better. Um, <laughs> come on. Uh, but yeah, just post it. And just post it, do it, get it up there, get it out there. It's going to be bad. The first things you make are going to be terrible. I'm still making terrible things every day. But eventually, someone's going to come along and go, hey, I really like this. And then that's, that's where it all begins. Sometimes be the content that you just smack together real quick and expect nothing of it. Every and that's time. The one that Every time. Yeah. But you spend, you spend months on a video, 10 out of 10. Great. What about it? Yeah, I think advice for my previous self would be don't listen to the naysayers. Um, like, just be careful who you accept advice from, especially if you're easily influenced. And um, I'm such a people pleaser, so I always try to do things just in the safe zone and, and things like that. And until I decided, you know what, stuff it, I'm going to do it my own way, I started succeeding and there was nothing wrong with that and you know there's some people who do things a certain way and that's what they, they they can go ahead and do that but that's just not you so always be authentic to yourself um and you know i guess as well embrace your inner weirdo as well um is a big one and one thing one of my like tutors said back at uni that's always stuck with me is no one's ever better than you they're just different so like I've always been making this content anyone could have done my content exactly the same but not really because they're not me and that's the same it was like everybody is just you're unique in yourself so just know that like that's enough you know so um, that's a big thing is you know you just put faith in yourself there and, and um, that was a, that's a big thing for me and that's what always drives me. So, yeah, just try not to compare yourself. Well, you naturally do, but you just, you've got to be like, no, they're just different to me. They're not, they're not the same. So, yeah, don't let that fear take over. Just don't let it. It's hard, but just try not to. And your audience, you know, they come to your streams for you. Like, they don't necessarily need to see you play one specific yeah. game every time. Like, they followed you because you are you and you're so unique. That's why they keep coming back. So. Yeah, 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 thank you. <laughs> yeah, well, that's important to me that I wanted people to come not just because of the game, but because of who I was. And that's something I really found like with my audience as well and, and treating people like you want to be treated yourself. And they make me feel so important that it's so important to me that they feel important too. So it's really important that I remember, well, I, I try so hard to remember as many people as possible who come in often and I had um, one of my um, viewers, Crystal, if you're watching, uh, she reached out saying her partner was, um, 
her partner said to her, who doesn't watch lives, he's like, oh, she mentions like people's names in every stream, like she knows them. That's really sweet. That's really cool. And, I, and that meant so much when she said that to me. So even if like, even if you're just a viewer, just message your favorite creator and give them a little kind of a boost like that because it's really nice to hear. Um, but yeah, and as a creator, I'll just accept that and be like, yeah, I'm doing good. <laughs> yourself on the bed. But yeah, so that's what's really important. Just yeah, look after your people as well. They're, they're viewers and they don't have to watch you, but they do. So yeah, be nice. <laughs> um, I'm also going to cheat and say a couple. Um, <laughs> the first one, especially for live streamers out there, you don't need to stream stupid long hours. Um, when I first started, I maybe streamed eight to ten hours on average, four times, four five times a week, um, which is too much, definitely too much. Um, you know, I would occasionally do impromptu twelve-hour streams. I thought in my head at the time, oh, it's great, we're getting more exposure, it's fantastic, etc. Um, you know, I, I quite often do two-hour streams now, and it's the most successful I've been ever. So. You know, if you use that time to do other things, where it be learn how to edit, make a video, make a TikTok post, make anything, or even just touch grass and refresh, um, you don't need to stream for 10 hours, basically. Quality over quantity, for sure. What is grass? What is that? Uh, I, it's a myth, I think. I'm not sure, yeah. I haven't left my house in seven. This is the first time I've left my house in seven days. But... Um, and the second one I'd say is, Especially like when you're a new creator, I'd say, and you're kind of like branching out into the industry and everything like that. Don't be afraid to message and ask for advice from people that are in the similar niche or streaming as well that are doing well in the thing you want to do well in. Um, and quite often, if someone messages me, I'll be more than happy to give advice or reply, or whatever. Um, but thinking back when I first started, it was extremely daunting to even think about doing anything like that. Um, I was like, oh, I'd never message that person. Why would I do that? Um, but no, it's, it's like it's nice when you get a message asking for help. You're like, oh, look, they're trying to do well. They want to do well. Here's my advice or what I thought does well. Um, so yeah, I just highly suggest people kind of reach out and rip that bandaid off as well. Uh, we do have some time for a couple of audience questions. So if anyone would like to ask a question to any of the panelists, uh, there is a microphone right there. So. Your turn. <laughs> Come on. Oh. You want to just turn on the switch on the... Yeah. Hello? Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Reaching across multiple contents, like when you're sort of like Mimo, you're more, you're more pursuing YouTube, but when you're going like across your Instagram reels or your TikToks or anything else you're branching out, how do you find to bring your communities to those other platforms that you're sort of committing to? Man, I don't know if I should answer this one because I struggle with that to be honest. Um, uh, it's it's a difficult one. I've definitely found you know. Like I do, I've done YouTube videos and I've got that audience and then if I start posting TikToks, if some of those blow up and do really well, I never find it converts back to YouTube. Uh, maybe this is just me, maybe you guys have had better luck, but it is really difficult. And I think you can kind of take a few things from that, but I would say there's different little sub-genres of communities within your niche. So I might have people that only know me from TikToks that they've seen. And that's that little audience. I might know me, people might know me just from the YouTube stuff or terrible Instagram photos. That audience, I don't know. <laughs> but it's all these different little sub genres. They don't have to be all the same. Um, yeah, I think that kind of answers the question. Definitely. Basically, I'm bad at it, is what I'm saying. <laughs> um, I have a take on it as well, though. If um, you, some people uh, say they might go live on one platform with the pure intention to convert them to another platform. So, so like, I'm live on Twitch, go here. Um, I find, unless you're at a point where you're so big that you don't talk to a chat or audience at all, it doesn't really work. Um, 
the best way to, for me personally to do it would be get them to like your personality on whatever platform you're on, and then they'll want to find out where else you are. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great response. I think it can sometimes be a bit of a trickle effect where it may not be like directly watching a, an Instagram reel or something then going and following a YouTube, but they might, over the course of a few months, get some of your personality, become a big fan, and then go and find your extra content somewhere else. Yeah. Thank yeah. you, good question. Thank you. Great question. Mm. This is a sort of streaming question. When you're just starting out, is it better to pick one platform like Twitch or YouTube and stick with it, or should you try to do both at once, like at the same time? I can't remember what the dual streams called. I think for oh, sorry, yeah. like simultaneous, the way to look at what you got. Oh, I always just say like I think when I started growing as a content creator, I just chose one platform at a time to focus all my energy on. Um, so for myself, I started on Twitch and then I kind of just focused on that and then when I wanted to build another platform I would then just shift and focus on each one because I feel like it is easy to focus for me at least on one thing at a time and then when you start to build that community that want to discover you across those other platforms, it makes it easier to then start building those other platforms as well. Yeah, exactly the same as what Alyssa said, so retweet. <laughs> so you, would you schedule, sorry, you would schedule during the week, some days would be on one platform, other days would be on another? Yeah, another yeah, way? I schedule my whole life. <laughs> um, but yeah, I basically, I scheduled Twitch to start with, and then I would start, once I started building that community there, I would then schedule time to focus on something like Instagram, for example, and then build like what I wanted my feed to look like there, and then when I wanted to start making real content, I would then also schedule time to then shift that to things like TikTok and then like other platforms in the mix too. But I found the scheduling part helped for me because, yeah, I just focus on one thing at a time and then I can pour my whole heart and soul into it and then people know that they can find me across those platforms but they'll have something to take away from each platform that I've poured myself into as well. I think lastly, a big part of that is how much time do you have? Because <laughs> if you are limited with time, you might want to consider what type of content do I want to make and how will I get discovered? Um, you know, if you're playing a very, very niche game that doesn't have an, an audience and you're on maybe a platform that doesn't have that reach as well at the same time, it might be harder compared to somewhere which has natural reach of like a for you page where it scrolls down um, if it's like less niche of a, you know, more niche of a game. So, um, yeah, time's a big one. We all burn out. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, this was a question for the parents of the panelists. <laughs> oh, sorry, the panelists who are parents. It's a better way of working that. <laughs> how do you find yes. going? How do you find going live and creating content with a child? Yeah. A rant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it's yeah, because well, um, Pregante, not that we're your partner in. I am, yeah, me. <laughs> I am, yeah. Congratulations. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, good question, because I used to ask that a lot to a lot of like parents, and I was always like, oh, that's so good. I looked up to a lot of those creators too. But um, you, I, well, number one, I have a really supportive partner, and he, um, he knows that this is my hobby and my passion and he um, looks after the bub for me and like I only have one at the moment and um, yeah and so he, he just kind of holds the fort for me but I've been getting that, that mum guilt where I'm just like alright do because I was streaming at 5 o'clock and he was still awake and so I was like no 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 alright okay, I'm going to now change my schedule to be um, after he goes to bed I'm going to start streaming and the first year is hard because you're tired so be kind to yourself and your audience will always be there. And the good thing about like TikTok, for example, is they don't punish you for not being around for a couple of months. That's why I really recommend TikTok for, for parents who want to do well in streaming, because um, yeah, like that that really helped. And I guess also, um, the, yeah, I have my streams are only like an hour and a half. Like they're not long. And it's the same as that Walker was saying. Like I don't have time to do long streams. So you just gotta make what you can, like when they're having a nap, quickly just film something or do what you want to do, just quickly film a quick, like, weird video or whatever. Um, but be kind to yourself if you don't finish or you don't complete it. It's okay, there will be time 
then they go back down to sleep. <laughs> um, but yeah, just whilst they're napping. <laughs> We're at the two and a half years of age, so there's less naps. But she refuses to sleep. Yeah. So I'm like, okay, it's seven o'clock. We're going live, and she'll be up till eleven with me screaming. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. That's a, that's definitely a hard one. Like, especially, like, yeah. That's why it's good when I have my partner because he's like, I know that that's your stream, you know, because he has like three days that he does his hobby where he plays Warhammer and plays basketball, and so I let him do his stream in the morning and I hold the fort with the baby and things like that and then uh, it's just a matter of kind of taking turns and hopefully having a, a someone there to help you out um, that's a huge thing and if you don't have that um, just be patient with yourself and wait till they're at that age where like if they go to daycare that's when you can scream or something like that you know like just any of those little gaps if you really are passionate about it and really want to do it you'll yeah you'll try to make it work the best you can but it's not easy but yeah I hope that your question. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so that wraps up the panel today. Um, thank you all for coming down. And uh, could please get a round of applause for our awesome panel. Uh, I hope you all have a wonderful weekend at DreamHack. And uh, if you see any of us around, do feel free to come and say hi and choose yourself. But uh, yeah, thank you again. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Everyone, I'm not over. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't go. Woo! I couldn't go.